Um, please. Thank you very much, Ed. Thank you, everybody, for coming. First of all, thank you for friends here in ODI to uh, inviting me. Um, just one clarification: the book has been launched, but in continental Europe. I understand <laughs> it'd be a different meaning from here. So let's take this like the official European launch. Uh, the book was launched in, in April uh, in Washington, and then again uh, I had similar presentation in in Brussels and Rome and so on and so forth. So what uh, I tried to do is this one, I suspect, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. What? OK, here oh, it is. Yeah. OK, a little bit of marketing. So this is the book. <laughs> it looks much nicer there. Actually, it's kind of usual cheap IMF. <laughs> Don't quote me on that. Um, Amazon, Kindle, whatever. So go and buy. So Ed has just agreed they're going to buy 1,000 copies. So I'm going to keep this part of the presentation very short. So what I want to do, uh, basically three things. Again, I want to give you a little bit the flavor why we ended up writing this book, um, and a few thoughts on three areas which I think are still very much relevant and we've been kind of struggling, particularly over the last 15 years, if not 20. I want to show you something which is not exactly part of the book, but again, it, while we were doing the book, we started the book uh, uh, as the crisis was sort of starting. And uh, with the usual perfect foresight, we thought we had time to actually write a book. <laughs> and we didn't. So that's why it took a, uh, uh, much longer than we thought. But it was helpful because clearly the, the crisis really revealed or, or rediscovered for us things that we sort of had forgotten. It was helpful uh, focus our mind. And then I'd like to basically move more in a sort of broader discussion on where do we go here in terms of dealing and implementing reforms in this area. So let me move uh, quickly. Uh, this uh, quote is something that when we launched the book, our managing director, Min Zhu, should have said. Uh, I drafted this for him. Of course, he sort of improvised a little bit. But that's pretty much the, the, the meaning. People sometimes ask me, why is the IMF kind of focus on institutions? So well, you know, we do policy advice, surveillance, and all these things. If we don't have the machinery, the institution that actually translate and transform the policy advice something which is actually implementable, it's really kind of an academic discussion. So, and sometimes some of the mistakes the fund is accused of having committed over the years th th reflect a little bit of that. So we always assume that there is a functioning Minister of Finance, the usual kind of can opener sort of economist assumption. Um, and, and that's really brought back with the vengeance, I might say, during the financial crisis, the importance of institutions. It's not only us. I mean, just around the same time, you know, Asimoglu and Robinson came out with their tome of institutions, why nations fails, and so uh, again, it was a more of a collective sort of rethinking of the importance of institutions. The objectives are pretty clear. Uh, this is kind of started as a sort of a corridor conversation between me and Alan Schick. Most of you probably know who Alan is, uh, and Alan made a very sort of obvious sort of uh, statement. Well, we really haven't produced a book or something that takes stock of innovation that we've seen taking place over the world for the last 20 years. And of course, me, Alan, uh, strong academic, say, I did this 20 years ago. Perhaps we should write something else now and take stock of that. That's pretty much how the book sort of came about. And, and one of the main things that we learn, uh, unfortunately, the hard way in providing advice to countries, try to sort of build capacity in countries, uh, as these innovations were kind of became uh, um, uh, sort of more kind of uh, main uh, 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 stay of uh, public financial management, there was a bit of fragmentation. So each of the innovations has lived through the sort of flavor of the month kind of uh, phase. And, and if you look back, perhaps, uh, I'll comment on this a little bit later. Again, the record perhaps is not as encouraging uh, uh, as we would have liked. Um, and Diddy, of course, was to draw some less. So what has worked, what has not worked, and why? So uh, I think in this audience, I'm not going to spend that much uh, on, on what is public financial management. The, the only thing that I, we kind of, in writing the book, uh, uh, the idea is really, the focus is really on the word public in a way. Uh, it's interesting. It isn't actually, it's a comment that came up from one of the questions. In fact, it makes me nervous on the question I'm not going to get from you later. 
And somebody asked, there's not a single chapter on budgeting. And I said, right. <laughs> because <laughs> budget are kind of very narrow in, in, each, in each country, so usually central administration. So the, the focus is really, if you, want to, if you want to manage your public finances, I mean, budgets are increasingly sort of narrow. So you have lower level of governments, and as I would discuss, you have public enterprises, other forms of interventions that governments supply in try to steer the economy and income distribution and equity and all these uh, various things. So again, the definition has sort of evolved over the years from uh, everything that has to do with the budget with something which is much more. And the, the use of the word umbrella is very much from, from Alan Schick. Is, is the definition is still evolving in a way. <coughs> Uh, the objective, again, is pretty sort of mm, standard, sort of, they remind us of Musgrave's typical sort of three uh, typical objectives of fiscal policy. So, again, I won't spend much time on that. Uh, title, uh, again, this again came up from <laughs> another sort of question. I'm not sure we put that much time into figuring out what the title was, but again, we were asked why emerging, why architecture? The idea of architecture really brings the idea that it, it, it's, it's, it's a bit of a puzzle. Each, each piece is equally important. And again, as I said a minute ago, over the years, perhaps, we put too much emphasis, perhaps, on rules or too much emphasis on accounting. And, and each and every piece is equally important. And they really fit in a sort of uh, 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 coherent framework. And that, that's what we try to put in the book. Again, uh, which again was probably one of the mistakes that we've done, certainly as an international institution advising countries and, 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 and us, but also in some cases donors. The idea of emerging again also, uh, th this seems obvious, but one thing that we forgot, it, it, reforms in this area takes a hell of a long time. We, 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 we simply go to countries and we assume that things can happen if not overnight Certainly in a much shorter period because of, again, pressure from donors, pressure from kind of so-called markets, uh, pressure from politicians, and, and uh, in reality, things usually take much, much longer. Um, and and, and the, the, the word emerging, again, as I was saying a, a minute ago, the, the definition of what public financial management is still evolving in a way uh, we've learned. Uh, a lot over the years, and the crisis, in a way, is the usual kind of blessing in disguise, was kind of helpful to remind us of certain things that perhaps we thought we had addressed. Uh, the one thing that we asked Alan Schick in the, in, in the, the, to give us a bit of a conceptual framework, uh, which wasn't easy, it took Alan a little bit of time, and you can let you imagine the kind of discussion we had. Uh, uh, th the focus was really very much uh, back on information. Again, uh, surprisingly, uh, there are still a number of countries, not only those that went to kind of severe financial crisis, a uh, number of countries that are almost systematically sort of caught by surprises because they don't know where they are in terms of their financial situation. Again, so going back to information, again, this is a double-edged word though because I think we've managed to produce an overload of information only to realize that the only piece of information that we need for the mm, policy making is the one that's missing on the table. So <laughs> it's a bit of a rethinking in that area as well. And that it basically the information, the processes and procedure, how these are combined, they, they ultimately try to provide a positive incentives uh, throughout all the actors involved, clearly from the decision makers, typically in the political sphere, but then throughout the bureaucracy. Uh, good system try to do that and they do that. Uh, system not so successful try to basically come from a different angle which is basically the, sh the exposed sort of sanctioning sort of mechanism which you know they might work at times but you know my experience and my press also reflect my preference they usually don't work as effectively as what we have a more kind of positive uh, approach. Uh, what are the innovations that we mentioned here? So uh, again, again, this room I suspect we know oh, pretty much. We've seen in the last certainly 15 years, you know, fiscal rules, medium-term budget frameworks, 
the numbers that are there, one can question, uh, in fact, I, I kind of hatched this a little bit, sort of medium term budget framework. So again, so the numbers, I think the numbers come from a, a World Bank for publication. Um, uh, honestly, the effective medium term budget framework, is, uh, the number is much smaller than that. Same with fiscal rules. Is the issue the countries that have a lot of nice things on paper, legislation. Now, what happens in reality is quite different. And we go through this in the book uh, quite at length. Uh, what has become a little bit the flavor of the month, so to speak, is this proliferation independent fiscal agencies. And sometimes they do address uh, real problems. There is a need, but again, sometimes become another, you know, you have to do it because you have to do it or because somebody said this is is a new best practice, so you shall do it. So again, we can discuss this a little bit. Um, information, again, there's been a proliferation of, of, of information across the board, accounting, financial, uh, evaluations, uh, uh, um, performance. Um, again, my sense, perhaps, we've gone a little bit too far. There's too much information that probably we don't need or we don't need to actually influence uh, decisions, policy decisions. And the other thing that kind of, upon, you know, the usual benefit of hindsight, the last 15 years have really seen uh, the birth, so to speak, and then again, uh, spread of uh, international diagnostic from the fiscal transparency, the PIFA framework, and so on and so forth, which, which wasn't there before. So again, there's all this desperate almost attend, try to strengthen institution, but also try to devise a sort of a benchmark whereby this institution can be measured and, and, and countries sort of uh, compared against uh, each other. Uh, so, I mean, just to finish on the book, uh, in, in the end, certainly this is not a cookbook, so of course uh, it's not going to tell you how to do public financial management reforms in 12 easy lessons, etc. It, it's really sort of considerations. Uh, that these systems are complex, probably much more so than we would like to think. Uh, information is key, but as I said, uh, we tend to kind of go into sort of overload. Um, there's been, partly because of the financial situation, a little bit of a shift into sort of the micro variables, uh, and, and perhaps kind of forgetting a little bit the effectiveness sort of efficiency arguments. Um, Again, another obvious conclusion the context matters is essential, but often I, I hear this uniqueness sort of argument. And interestingly enough, when we had our mini crisis in the fund in 2008, we had to sort of swallow our medicine, as, as they say. We had to downsize. I was at the time in the budget office, and I said, OK, this should not be a problem. We've all done problem countries. We know how to do it. So I started meeting with my colleagues from the department, and all of a sudden, the IMF was a unique institution, and the European <laughs> department was a unique <laughs> department within the IMF, and so on and so forth. So I said, ah, OK, fine. <laughs> so OK, it never, it never stopped. So again, one has to be a little bit careful here. Um, and as I said, at the end, the book offered a number of considerations. I, I, I don't think we certainly didn't want to push. Honestly, I don't think we have an answer in how things should really be designed, as long as one is aware of the complexities and, and, and that all the various moving parts has to fit one, one with the other. Uh, just want to offer just a few thoughts, and some of my colleagues probably will pick on some of these. One that I, I'm, I'm personally a little bit frustrated on this one, because as I said, 130 countries claim that they have a medium-term budget framework. The reality is they don't. In the book, we analyze five of the sort of well-functioning medium-term budget framework, uh, and there are others. I'm not saying these are only the, 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 there are only five that are functioning. Um, one conclusion is they're all very different, for example. And particularly with colleagues in ODI, we work a lot in fragile state and low-income countries. There's always the tendency to go out and try to advise and sometimes even impose a model without really taking into account reality on the ground. So one of the lessons, these are five top-notch medium-term budget framework that over the years have been refined and continue to be refined. I mean, James will say something on the UK, for example. 
uh, and again, one of the, in, from my point of view, it's an element of beauty in a way because you realize that these are all very, very different. They really had to fit their individual country sort of context. And a military budget framework, again, it's not a solution, it's just one piece of a kind of chain, if you like, has to fit in a much more comprehensive fiscal framework. So again, let's not attach too much emphasis to countries to have a military budget framework. These are, these are complex per se, and are just one element of many others that have to fit together. So uh, again, so kind of just to leave the, uh, an obvious message, it's really more than meets the eyes, because the, 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 they really try to address uh, various objectives, uh, uh, um, and they're quite demanding. So again, one of the lessons from the countries we analyze in, 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 the, in the book, uh, how long it took. I mean, we all took a for uh, look at forward estimates in Australia, uh, and I was in Australia recently. Um, uh, basically, we're looking at 30 years of evolution, and they're still, well, that's an Australian syndrome. They're not very, they're very unsatisfied with what they have. Uh, probably uh, UK, I don't know whether it was 30 years, but 30 took a long time. Sweden, again, we're looking at 20 years and they're still evolving. So this idea you go out to a kind of emerging markets and in three years you shall have a medium term budget framework, eh, you know, it might work sometimes. I'm not ruling that out, but again, it's, it's a bit more complex than, than it is. Uh, accounting and reporting, an area that has seen in the last 15 years uh, 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 quite a remarkable uh, um, development in, uh, in a way. Uh, besides the heading that is kind of a cruel sort of countries that are increasingly moving to cruel or national accounts basis, which again, from an economic point of view, sort of makes sense, uh, but it sometimes it's easier said than done. So. Uh, but for example, we didn't even have uh, kind of standards sort of 15 years ago. Now, then the IMF came out with the GFS, then IFAC came out with IPSAS. This national accounts have been revised and are being revised as we speak. Eventually, at last, I would say even Europe have accepted that they need to have some sort of accounting reporting standards, um, given that the whole system is based on national accounts. So these are all good things that are happening. It, get, it, it simply takes a little bit longer than we thought. Having said that, again, the quality of information, uh, it's simply not the one that we would like to have. And I'll go a little bit more into that as discussing what we've learned in the, in the crisis. And, and again, I think we're also far from having what I call long-term fiscal sustainability analysis. Um, these are some of the issues that are still being discussed. And s the solutions are not easy, like any standards that are kind of proud of a compromise, so we'll have to cut a few corners, but you know, we managed to do it with the national accounts. I think hopefully we'll, we'll try to achieve something in this area as well. Fiscal risk, and this is the last I want to comment. Uh, uh, again, I'm assuming it's kind of familiar what, what fiscal risks are. Uh, Alan Schick was among the first one to write in this area, and the IMF also has been uh, quite vocal, and you know, we've also written quite a bit uh, the degree of success has been uh, really very small. There are very few countries that really engage systematically in fiscal risk analysis. Uh, and this is certainly an area where we would like countries, you know, to do more. And there are some proposals in the book, which uh, I won't comment now. But it goes back again to information and to this notion that the budget is very narrow. So countries are systematically caught by surprises, even if the central administration budget is, is kind of uh, solid enough and robust because of public enterprises, quasi-fiscal uh, activities, contingent liabilities, and so on and so forth. Again, it goes back to the need to have the right information. And, and, and in some cases, it's simply an issue of disclosure. So countries are still in denial. One of the story with Greece, uh, you know, is anybody from Greece in the room? So I don't want to offend anybody. But anyway, the issue is, oh, the, the, they were lying. Uh, perhaps, maybe, but if they were, they were lying on something that they knew. The problem is there was a lot of stuff they didn't know. Similar story in Portugal, I'll show you in a minute. So again, this is, again, goes back to this idea of information. 
Okay, I'm gonna show you just four or five charts. I'm gonna go very quickly. These charts, if you really want to know a bit more, they the, the, the really belong to a paper that we did exactly, we published about a year ago. We presented to our board a year ago and then was published in November. The paper is on fiscal transparency, uh, the paper that has triggered sort of revision of the code, which I think is still, uh, 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 still ongoing. Um, and, and again, we were working on the book and we were working on that project in parallel. So clearly we could have had, you know, another chapter on fiscal transparency, but then where is a public financial management failure or a fiscal transparency fa failure? You know, it's a little bit, the things are not as clear cut. Uh, but it goes back to the idea of kind of information. So again, we don't have the information uh, that, we, that, we, that we need when we need it. One of the things also that we learned in the crisis, a lot of systems that were looked good on papers uh, were not as strong as we thought. The classic example was Iceland. I'm, sh I'm sure in this room you're familiar with OECD publication. Uh, five, six years ago, ev in everybody's mind, Iceland would have been in kind of anybody's our top five kind of list. A cruel budget in our accounting, decentralization, uh, responsibility, fiscal situation was glorious, uh, they didn't know what to do with the revenues because everything was great. Crisis comes and, and it's, it's a house of cards. The whole thing collapses. When we realized there were problems, we went to the Minister of Finance and said, well, you know, there are really major issues with this ministry and the ministry. Municipalities are virtually bankrupt, public enterprises, they know where to borrow. And the Minister of Finance said, oh, this is not our problem. Because that's the almost ill-conceived idea of devolution, decentralization, cum responsibility. But at the end of the day, somebody has to be responsible uh, for the sovereign. And, and that clearly, situation has changed quite a bit. The same conversation in Portugal and Greece, by the way. So Mr. Finance was sort of innocent, so, so, so to speak, because the information simply wasn't there. Uh, in that paper, let me move this. Again, I don't want to I just want to kind of whet your appetite. So we actually go, you buy the book, first of all, <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then you go and read that paper, which again, is the last project I did before leaving that division. Uh, we try to unpack the, 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 this increase in, in gross debt in, 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 in the countries affected by the crisis. Uh, what, uh, 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 and clearly each country is, is it's sort of a bit of a different story, of course. But we try to unpack this as you can see, there were, first of all, it goes back to information. There were revisions due basically because the basic quality of information simply wasn't, wasn't good enough. So as the situation deteriorated, there was a number of revisions with Greece clearly sort of leading the pack. Uh, the change to the government boundary, again, because of state enterprises and PPPs which were classified outside the government, uh, even if we, we, we knew they were absolutely governmental agencies. The, 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 the most glaring case was the U.S., which is mortgage companies, Freddie uh, uh, and Mac, as they call them. Uh, but this was something that happens in Greece and Portugal and so on and so forth. Uh, there were the usual tricks between the cash and accruals, that's fine, but the numbers were not as outrageous. One of the things that goes back to fiscal risk analysis and vulnerability, countries were really caught by surprise as the output sort of fell, but they were surprised by how much revenue they lost, which wasn't a difficult, terribly difficult exercise to do, it's simply that they don't do it. So again, uh, uh, and the fact then last, the was it in some countries there were intervention to sustain financial institutions. So this gives an idea of the kind of problem, and I think we were trying to be honest enough there were other factors as usual, errors and omissions, things that we couldn't quantify. So, but I think, I think this table gives a kind of summarize a little bit the kind of problems that, that we've been dealing with. Uh, timeliness, Greece. Now, one of the frustrating things, as we were doing all these charts and all these figures I'm gonna show you and you'll find more in that paper, these were all information that was available. So we, we mean in the fund or the commission or other sort of, perhaps we could have been a bit more vocal uh, uh, on certain things. In Greece, the issue was that the data uh, kept being revised up to five years after the fact. Now, we all accept that data are always preliminary, tentative, then they're refined, and, and that's it. 
Now, if that continues to happen for five years, that's a kind of an indication that perhaps there's something that's not quite right. So again, the information was there. The coverage, as I said, uh, uh, as, as the crisis plunged, the state enterprises and PPPs was a big item in this one, quasi-fiscal activities, uh, lower level of governments that according to uh, individual countries uh, in, consti in, cons in constitutional laws are independent or autonomous, they went bankrupt. And of course, guess what? Government, central government had to intervene one way or the other. So all these, all these pretty much uh, uh, happen and no country so sort of was excluded. Uh, Portugal, this, is, this basically gives the idea of the coverage of fiscal reports. This is the general government gross debt as was reported to Brussels based on official statistics. Crisis starts 2007, 2008, there is a discrepancy there. Um, and this discrepancy was explained by the fact, again, there were state enterprises and PPP initiatives that were outside the boundary, so to speak, but then were reclassified according to Eurostat uh, criteria into the budget. That was not the end of it, though. Uh, public enterprises were in particularly bad shape, and some of them, one could argue, whether were indeed enterprises or not covers of the agencies. Uh, and these are all kind of entities that were basically uh, uh, addressed within the program with, with the so-called Troika. And then icing on the cake, there were the mergers of expenditure arrears. So it was a kind of perfect storm, so to speak. But that's what happens. I mean, in the crisis, the market is low. Everything, anything that can go wrong, does go wrong. Uh, slippages in the execution of the budget. Again, Greece, in the old days, fiscal plan is the phase when Greece and other countries were sending their plans to, to Brussels. Uh, but the time they were started their own internal budget discussion, they were already 2.2% off from those plans, meaning that those plans were really pure compliance sort of oriented exercise. In the budget preparation discussion between Minister Finance and, and the line ministries, again, budget preparation, they were off another 3% and approval clearly the discussion with parliament and so on and so forth. Then you start the budget, you try to execute the budget has been approved, then you add another 10%. So at the end, on, at the end of the story, you're basically 15% off what your original plans was. Uh, arrears, again, this just gives you an idea of magnitude of the problems in Greece and Portugal, uh, where the problem were um, largely uh, health, which health tend to be a problem pretty much everywhere. And in the case of Portugal, but also also the issue with regional government. So again, this is something that revealed that the system clearly were not as strong as we thought. And one area which we don't address in the book, but we again it came back with the vengeance, was a particular on the budget execution side. Uh, the the mechanism that simply supposed to control spending, to prevent spending to exceed any appropriation approved, they were simply extremely weak. So agencies were just accumulating arrears and bypassing all sort of uh, budget uh, regulations quite easily, which was very surprising. Okay, if I can use the last five minutes here. Couple of minutes. <laughs> Couple of minutes. <laughs> Where do we go from here? And this is more kind of personal reflection. So uh, I don't think the record is all that great if we look back and all these innovations. There were a lot of ideas, a lot of things were put on the table. Um, certainly I'm not very kind of satisfied here. Again, we, we, we don't really know sometimes why we do reforms. Uh, there is a book, I'm sure you're familiar, that Matt Andrews has put out this year, right? Yes. Um, it goes much more systematic into this. That there are various problems here, um, countries, why countries do reforms. And there's all this, what I call kind of dominance of the best practice. You do reforms because somebody else has done it or because somebody flying from Washington or Brussels says, you know, you shall do this. A a and reforms don't stick because they don't address real problems. So they become these sort of the, the euro versus de facto sort of reforms. Uh, and it's difficult in this area also to define success. 
So it's very difficult to kind of pinpoint on a particular measure that will say, okay, yes, done it, succeeded. Um, reforms tend to be poorly prepared and rushed. Uh, and again, as I mentioned a year ago, good uh, reformers uh, have taken decades to refine the system and are still being refined. Inadvertently, unwillingly, I like to think, but we probably pass on this idea that reforms are a one-off one sort of exercise. You do your reform, you pass your decree, you implement, and you're done. Uh, reforms never stop. It's an ongoing business. Uh, in fact, countries that have managed to do that, and clearly James here can testify for, for the UK Treasury, they never stop. They kind of becomes part of your daily routine, challenge the status quo and come up with solution. A lot of confusion in terms of the nomenclature that we use. A lot of reforms are inspired by public interest, interest and public governance. Uh, w w oftentimes, we, we, we have no idea what we're talking about here. So the very misused and abused terms that, that when you try to operationalize that, they, they mean pretty much nothing. Uh, typically, what we do, and I'm try to conclude, we go in a country, I mean, you always say, oh, you should, you, you country should do reforms in good times. Well, it, it, it just doesn't happen that way. There are exceptions, of course. Uh, so you always have to need to some sort of a crisis, where is engineer or the genuine, where is financial, where is it political. And when that happens, then you rush into, into quick solutions, uh, which again, sort of, they don't, they don't stick. They very rarely try to lead to more fundamental and, and sustainable reforms. Uh, that, and because of that, they tend to be sort of driven by an external advisor, international institutions, or countries that are perceived as leading the way. At one point, we had the New Zealand season, and, and so on and so forth. The Anglo-Saxon, so to speak, and then the Northern European, and God knows what will be next. Uh, and typically, when you go to countries, they have the usual routine. Uh, you ask what are the problems, everything is fine. Then how do you explain all this and that and the other? And then there's a little bit sort of acceptance, and then eventually, okay, fine. And they understand there is a problem, it's our problem. Probably it doesn't come from Washington or Brussels, then you start to deal. But usually it takes a lot, long time for that process sort of to play out. Last minute. Last minute. So, what, again, good reformers, my experience, is, is, is really try to generate uh, this kind of reform culture. Again, uh, sometimes you have very sort of perverse incentives within uh, uh, civil service that prevent, actually, people to challenge the status quo. Basically, you get your promotion because you'll deliver the budget on time. That's about it. You don't get your promotion because you basically challenge the fact that the budget, in some cases, most cases, I would say, it's something that nobody can understand, nobody can read, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And, and, and the rest that you have on the slide is pretty much what I, what I mentioned a little bit. There is this, 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 this best practice sort of dominance, and, and, and so you rush a decree and you're done. Well, that's the easy part. Then the implementation comes, and it's difficult because very few people have thought about where it can be implemented, where you have the right people, whether you have the right skills, where you have the various champions throughout the, ch the, the, the chain that can actually make sure that reforms are actually implemented and changes actually occur in a sustainable way. Uh, and, and as I said again a few, a, few, a few minutes ago, the issue that reforms has to be sustained. It, it, it's a never-ending game, it's a repeated game. So you really have to do it, has to become part of your routine. And unfortunately, as I said, we, we, we sort of fail to, to, to pass that message. These, I think, we discuss. And, and this is the last, uh, just a collection of very sort of, perhaps we can leave this on the screen. Um, uh, as I said, these are some of the, but there are many more that, of course, I <laughs> try to compress everything in one slides. Uh, uh, again, many reforms, if I can summarize, are, are, just, are just not ill-prepared, and, and, and because they usually they don't really tend to address real problems on the ground, which lead to 
also. And this is perhaps oversimplifying a little bit, of course. But, but um, that explains in my mind, if I look back, I've been in this business for now more than 15 years, there are not that many successes, to be honest. So uh, lots of good initiatives, of course, but you know, only time will tell. Thank you so much for your attention. So look forward to hear from my colleagues.